Hello and welcome to another episode of Trailblazers. I'm your host, Zaki Manji. Thank you for joining me today at the beautiful Ismaili Centre in London. Tonight's guest is an inspirational exemplar of leadership and philanthropy, building on a vision of hope and determined to provide quality education and healthcare to children. Farah Williamson is a co-founder of Wakadogo, a not-for-profit school serving 450 children in rural Uganda. Farah began her career in major donor fundraising at Cancer Research here in the UK. She's now the Director of Gulf and Strategic Partnerships at Plan International Canada, an organisation that focuses on the advancement of human rights for children and equality for girls. Farah is an absolute testament to the belief that education for all is a shared responsibility. Building both a sustainable future for children in Uganda, the country where she grew up, Farah is bringing awareness to the impact of social change through her commitment to core values of generosity, of integrity, and of improving the well-being of humankind. Please join me this evening as we discuss the challenges of working in a non-profit sector and Farah's own journey on impacting change in the world, one small step at a time. So, Farah Williamson, you're joining me now. It's, it's wonderful to be with you today. Um, there is so much we have to discuss, but first, an initial question for you. So I've got, I've got a few questions written down here. So can you tell us the story of how Wakadogo came to be? Give us a sort of an overview of the school and, and sort of the philosophy behind it. Yeah, so if I can, I'm going to take you back and tell you a bit of a personal story um, from when I was 10 years old. Um, so I'm going to take you back to um, Rwanda to 1994 when we lived there. Um, when I was 10 years old in April, overnight, a genocide started. And within about 100 days, 800,000 people were slaughtered, um, including my nanny, Clementine, who was like a second mom to me. Um, and I remember as a 10 year old girl, feeling two emotions really, really strongly at that point. Um, one was guilt, guilt because I was British and that meant that I would be evacuated and there would be no questions. And two was a sadness that I don't think I've ever really felt um, since that day. And the sadness obviously um, for leaving Clementine behind. It has, officials say, been the biggest and fastest flight of humanity the United Nations has witnessed in nearly 50 years. Tens of thousands of refugees pouring out of the country, east to Tanzania and here north to Uganda. Altogether, it's estimated that more than a million people have been forced from their homes by a campaign of butchery that shows no sign of ending. And I think that that experience has shaped me more than I can really ever understand. But I know that everything that I've done since, um, including Wakadogo and especially Wakadogo, has been in honor of Clementine and of all the other people who, who suffered and who died tragically um, during that terrible time. In terms of Wakadogo, the story, um, if I fast forward then um, 10 years um, to 2005, well, 11 years, um, I was at McGill um, as an exchange student and um, I was in this political science class and I met this young lady called Andrea, and we spent many uh, coffee break at Tim Hortons. Um, great donuts. <laughs> great donuts. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about the world and the equalities in the world, in inequalities in the world. And I remember telling her about Uganda, <clears throat> where I grew up. Um, Aside from living in, in Rwanda, I, I also lived in, in Uganda for most of my childhood. Um, and at the time, there was a Lord's Resistance Army, a rebel army up in the north, and they were abducting children. And these children, I mean, in their, in their thousands were being abducted, and they were being turned into child soldiers or sex slaves. And we couldn't believe that no one seemed to know about this. No one seemed to be talking about this issue. And we both decided um, that we really needed to do something about this. And actually, at the time, my mum 
had called me and had said something very similar. Um, and so we all connected really on this kind of one issue and feeling that something had to be done, no matter how small, but something just needed to be done. And so that's really how the journey started. Um, it was then a, a, really, a really exciting and crazy journey because we knew that we had to go to Uganda for ourselves to really understand um, what the challenges were, what the situation was, and to really hear from the people themselves to know what we had to do and what the solution was. Um, so Andrea and I both traveled to um, the north of Uganda, um, to Gulu, which at the time just wasn't, wasn't done. It was, it was quite unsafe. The Lord's Resistance Army was very much still in Gulu abducting children. Um, and um, yeah, it was, uh, it was such an incredible journey because two things really stuck in our minds. Um, one was actually hearing the children walk every night leaving their homes within their, the IDP camps that they were living in and walking into the center of Gulu to protect themselves from being abducted. And that, that kind of, that sound of the pitter-patter of children has never really left my mind um, because it was so eerie to think that children who normally go home for safety yeah. were leaving their homes um, and going to sleep under bus shelters and in NGO-run community centers. And I remember thinking, there's something really, really wrong about this. Um, and then the second thing was actually going into the IDP camps and seeing for ourselves, you know, there were 1.8 million people living in these IDP camps. And um, what really struck us was that there were, there were no schools, there were no health centers, there was just no infrastructure. And when we spoke to parents, um, community leaders, children, everyone was telling us, you know, we want schools, we need to go to school, we want to be in school, but there were no schools. And so it just made us think how important it was that we did something in terms of education provision um, because of that, that desperate call for education. Um, and so we, Actually, I have to tell you about a gentleman I met there, um, okay. an elderly gentleman who, he was, in, he, was in, he was in one of the IDP camps, and I remember him very clearly because he, 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 he sort of stood to one side and he was kind of watching us and kind of seeing what we were doing. And he did, he, he, he did interact with us, but, but after he'd seen us kind of walk around and, and speak to others, and I remember he said one thing to us. He said, you're taking pictures, and when you go back home, don't do what all the other Muzungus go do and forget about us. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, he's so right. You know, and, and that really stuck with me because it made me think that we have to come back. Like, we have to do something about this because it, it would just be so wrong for us to leave and, and not do anything. Um, and so that's really when the whole kind of real hard work started. Um, we came back with kind of even more determination than ever before um, and, and decided that we needed to speak to everyone that we could about raising money and, and kind of raising attention um, to highlight the situation. And so we, we drove to Ottawa, we met with um, the then uh, Ugandan High Commissioner, we met with um, Senator Mubina Jaffa, both these women extremely supportive and encouraging of, of what, we were, what we were about to do. And then we just started fundraising, um, you know, by throwing parties and bake sales and, you know, small and large. And, and we, just, we just hustled, basically. We just did what we could. <laughs> we didn't know what yeah, we were doing, uh, but we knew we had to raise the money. Yeah. And within, uh, you know, within a, a few months, we had raised the $100,000 that we needed to, um, to go out there and to buy the land and register the NGO and, and start building. And we built, we built it one classroom at a time. We didn't go in and just, you know, put up a whole set yeah. of buildings. We just, we didn't have the money to do that, to be Oops, honest. Yeah. Um, so we did it, you know, one classroom at a time, one building at a time. And it was only years later when I spoke to school providers, you know, large school providers, that I found out that that's actually the right way to do it. Because, you know, you then, um, each class then graduates organically through the, through the school. And so you have 
by the end of it, children who've been through the whole school journey. So the school sort of grows with them almost. So exactly, the school grows with them. So yeah, 450 children now in this school. Um, and yeah, when I think back, it's just been, what, what a journey. I mean, it, it, I mean, it certainly sounds like it. And it sounds like, you know, the, the partying and the bake sales are all put to brilliant use. You know, you've got a school with a huge number of children who have, who have benefited from this now. Now, so one question I do have for you. Tell us about the name Wakadogo. Mm. What does it mean? Yeah, wak so Wakadogo in Swahili means for the little ones. Um, and um, we, we decided to use a, a Swahili name because it's the language of East Africa. So it would, it would hopefully resonate with, um, with more than just um, the community in Uganda <coughs> and, and hopefully re resonate with, with, with the world and anyone who'd ever had any interaction with, with East Africa. I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a wonderful name for sort of, you know, what you're trying to do. I think it's, you know, too often we have these names where people think, oh, you know, it has to have a, a very sort of deep philosophical meaning. Actually, it's just, it's perfect. It really fits well. So, I, yeah, I think well chosen. I think, you know, lucky it's not Boaty McBoatface <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so to your day job, you are the, one of the directors at Plan International in Canada. Um, what do you do? What, you know, what does that entail? And how does that role and your role with Wakadogo, how do those worlds collide? And how do you sort of ensure that they complement one another? Yeah, great question. Um, so I work for Plan International Canada. Um, and Plan is an organization that works in 70 countries. And it's dedicated to children's rights and equality for girls. Um, the, they, these... These organizations, the, the kind of big picture that I get with PLAN and the big impact that I get with PLAN. So I get to work on, you know, global issues, macro level issues, um, you know, policy change um, projects that are reaching hundreds of thousands of children in a number of different countries. Um, and, I, and I feel like I have a tremendous impact through that work. And then, and then you've got Wakadogo, which is so personal to me and um, such a small but grassroots initiative um, where I, you know, where I know the individual children and I know that I'm having an impact in, in such an individual way. Um, I think, you know, Wakadogo is my sort of evening and weekend job, whereas Plan International Canada is my day job and, and an organization I'm really proud and passionate uh, to, work, to work for. Um, with, with Wakadogo, you know, we, we couldn't do it without the donors that we have supporting us and, and without the, and, and there aren't that many, you know, when I, when I talk about these individuals, I'm talking about, you know, less than, less than 10 really, um, who are so committed to um, helping us find this hundred grand a year that we need to keep finding to keep the school going every, every year. Um, so yeah, it's been open for 10 years now, 11 years this year. Um, and uh, just so grateful for, for both the, the donors and, and the supporters that we have and, and obviously the team um, that I'm part of at Wakadogo, my co-founders and the team on the ground in Uganda. I, I, think, I think, you know, so often um, in the international development sort of world, you know, you can either be at a very sort of, as you say, sort of a global vision of what you're seeing where impact is being, you know, is, is having is having a change and, and making change to people's lives. But actually, I think the beauty of what you've got with Plan and with Wakadogo is you've got both of those views. So you can actually see the, 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 the world vision, but you've got the change on the ground that you can actually put down on what, you know, say, I did that. I know that I've done that. And we have made a change in someone's lives. I think it's, it's brilliant. I think um, having these two things, you know, it's, international development is, is never a... It's never a sort of a, a positive singing, dancing thing all the time. You know, it, it can be, there are moments of, of real sort of, you know, heartache and, and, and difficulty. Do you ever have moments where you sort of think, this is just way too much? You know, opening a school in a, in a sort of a really remote location, a thousand miles away from where we're sitting here in London today. I mean, it's a mammoth task. And, and you know, if you have those feelings, when you have those feelings, how do you sort of, you know, recenter yourself and, and, and come back to the sort of positives of it? Because, you know, at the end of it, it's a, it's a wonderfully positive thing. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and I'm not going to lie. Of course, there are there are days when I think I don't know how <laughs> how I'm going to do this. Um, but you know, I'm so lucky to be part of a team where we where we lift each other up. When you know, we all have ebbs and flows in our lives, and you know, we've kind of been through having children, and you know, 
I'm not there yet. Well, you, you will. And when <laughs> I'll you get do, there it's, one day. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. But so, we, you know, we've, we've, really, um, we've really worked together and helped each other to, to kind of pick up where, you know, wh when others haven't been able to pick up as much. But also, you know, having our funders and our donors who are so dedicated and who they themselves have been there and, and seen for themselves, um, it, it means that, you know, we know we have that backing. We know we have those people behind us. Um, and when you meet those children and when you see, um, you know, the, the hardship that they've been through, yet they are so determined and so keen to come to school every day. You know, I remember going out there just last year and I, and I met this young boy who ran up to me and he said, you know, I found out about, about Wakadogo on Facebook. Yeah. And, um, and I told my parents we needed to move to that village, to, your, to this really? village where Wakadogo is, so I can go to Wakadogo. And I just thought, that's incredible. Um, but, you know, when you think about what these people have had to go through in their lives and what their parents have had to go through, it just, how, how can we stop? How can we let them down? You know, it's like having 450 of your own children in a way, um, you know, you, you just can't, you can't let them down. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's really what keeps me going. I, I, th I think that's, it, it's wonderful. I think, you know, here in the sort of the, the Western world, we can sometimes take education massively for granted, you know, age sort of seven, eight, nine, ten. I can think of a huge number of occasions where I thought to myself, I don't want to go to school today. You know, why am I bothering? I just want to sit and read books or watch TV or whatever it was, you know, stuff my face with chocolate. And um, luckily, my parents put a stop to that. But anyway, you know, you've got um, one of the guiding principles of Wakadogo is the power of education. And you've sort of previously advocated access to schools. And I quote you now, only the educated is free. What does this statement mean to you? Yeah, so actually that's a quote that we have on our website and it's a Mandela quote. Um, and I, I, I love that quote because you can take anything away from someone, but you can't take away their education. Um, and I think that's hugely powerful. Um, and then, you know, in my family, I'm the first to have a university education. And I've seen what it can do, how it can change the course and the course of anyone's life, really. And um, and it can be it can be the source of being able to reach your full full potential. Um, and so, of course, of course, it's important to make sure that you have basics like food and water and um, you know access to uh, healthcare and so on. But we really really believe that if children miss out on an education and they have no way of pulling themselves out of poverty um, and we can build on on that you know we we now we've also built a healthcare center at Wakadogo so we're looking at things from a holistic perspective and that's really really important we provide free school meals so children are learning on full stomachs otherwise they just don't learn um, and so we we really do try and think of it from 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 that perspective but but making sure that children love coming to school and, and are able to be there and um, just seeing the impact of it. You know, we have one, one I remember this story so clearly, this, this one boy who graduated from Wakadogo School, so it's a primary school. And, you know, that, that stage between primary and secondary is, is a time when a lot of children drop out because, um, you know, primary school is free for children in Uganda, but secondary school isn't. Um, and so, there was this young boy called Emmanuel who um, he was an orphan and he lived with his elder sister and he upon graduating from Wakadogo found out about a scholarship program that was being made available to children from northern Uganda which he applied to um, he got it Brilliant. amazingly and he is now finishing his senior four in a school that's been totally paid for for him um, wow. secondary school and, um, you know, that's our first graduating class, you know, and I'm so excited to see what he does when he graduates from secondary school. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that, you know, we'll see him go to university um, and be able to eventually come back and do something for his community. Um, but up until now, things are looking really good. And, and all of the children from our first graduating class are in secondary school, which is just mm -hmm. incredible. Um, bar one girl who, who's a seamstress. Um, okay. But... Yeah, it's uh, education is a long term investment. You know, it's not a um, a short term investment where you can see, you know, for example, a, a vaccination drive. You know, where you know at the end of the day you've vaccinated a thousand people. Yeah. 
you know, education really takes, um, it takes time, it, it's a, a long-term investment and you have to wait and see. But in the meantime, you have to really be consistent and continue to, to support that provision and, and make sure that children have all, you know, all, all access that they, that they deserve. I think I think you've you've massively emphasised the point that you know education isn't it's not just a school it's not just bricks and mortar it's not just workbooks and pens and, and pieces of paper it's it's the experience it's the sort of you know, the guiding principles of it that um, that are coming through and I think it's it's a wonderful story about Emmanuel and you know hopefully we'll see his you know his name plastered all over the Ugandan press as as a, a you know sort of a change maker in the future I mean it's it's really really wonderful so. Now to our audience. So we've got a global audience watching us today, and I want to ask you, for any of the aspiring change makers who might be in our audience today, of which I'm sure there are a huge number, what's your advice to them, knowing what you know now? And what would you say to others who want to make a difference in sort of marginalised or, you know, hard-to-reach parts of the world? I think two things. Um, one is don't assume you know what they need. Um, Go out there and actually ask them. You know, do focus group discussions. Mm. Just talk informally to as many people as you can. Really, really get into the weeds of what's going on <coughs> and, and, and what they feel is, is the solution. Because sitting here in London or anywhere else in the world without being on the ground and without knowing you know, the, the lived realities of someone's everyday life, um, we, we can't know the solutions. Um, the second thing I would say is um, be really acutely aware of the power dynamics that both race and money can create. Um, and just be careful not to, not to fall into those traps. Um, and so th there's a lot that can come out of that. But, but yeah, it's really important that, that we question those and that we really think about those as, as we're going into communities and, and supporting them to pull themselves out of poverty. And I, I get the sense from, from just from sort of the passion and the compassion with which you're talking about Wakadoga and your work, you know, if you could start over again, you'd do it exactly the same way. I think, I think um, you know, it turned out well in the end. And, right. uh, you know, we, we learnt, we learnt as we went, you know, as we went and, you know, as I was mentioning about, about, you know, building a school and we're really lucky. We have such a great team on the ground um, who are, who would just move mountains to provide education to the children that, that, that they, that they're there providing education to. So, you know, we're really, we're really, really lucky. Of course, I wish we could have opened 10 schools and 20 schools and 30 schools. And I, you know, I wish that we could do more. Um, this is just one school in one community. But I am really proud that we're focused on quality and that we've really taken the time to make sure that we do things right. And, um, you know, and that in that community, we can really be proud of the, the school that we've built. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think you should be incredibly proud. I think it's a, it's a really wonderful thing to do because um, so many people sort of, you know, will sit in their armchairs and say, well, I'd, I'd love to do something, but never actually do. And so the fact that you are is, is incredible. So I want to read something to you. and I'm going to have to refer to my sheet of paper here and it might sound familiar. So we're doing something very small in the grand scheme of things. We're not saying that we can solve the situation in northern Uganda. However, for 80 very young children and their families in a village just outside of Gulu, this nursery school project means hope. Hope that with education, they will be able to build a life never before possible. So that's from 2009, after you built a nursery school and received your first students. Your school now has, as you said, 400, over 450 girls and boys. How do you feel when you reflect on this? On, I mean, yeah, how do you feel? Wow, that's uh, amazing to hear because, yeah, I, I did write that in 2009 and it's just, it's amazing to feel that, you know, we grew and we progressed and I feel, I feel very proud of that. I feel very, very proud of the fact that, you know, it's not been easy and um, raising that 100k every year to keep it going is not easy, um, but we are so lucky in that we have such great support from, from, from our donors and, um, and that we, 
that we have such a great team, you know, as, as, a, as a group of co-founders and trustees who are based all over the world in Canada, um, in Spain, in the UK, um, and then, and then our, our team on the ground who are, who are just phenomenal. So, yeah, it's just, it's amazing to, to, hear, to listen to that quote, actually, and, and just reflect on the last uh, 10 years and think about how much has happened since um, and the crazy adventure that we've been on. Um, especially the last year with COVID, um, but yeah. And, and, and actually, you've, you've sort of anticipated my next question. What has the impact of COVID, of the coronavirus, been on the sector and more specifically on Wakadogo? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I mean, at first, we just thought, well, this will pass in a couple of months, surely. You know, I, th I, think, I think that's what the whole world maybe thought. Um, the smarter people probably knew that they had to start planning for a <laughs> yeah, vaccine. But um, those people in Oxford who, who come out with that f fantastic uh, beam of hope. But, um, but you know, we, when we closed, when, when the schools were closed, we were told it was only, you know, for 30 days and then, and then we would reevaluate. Um, and, you know, schools closed all over the world. Millions of children um, were studying from home and... and but it was different in Africa and in, and in many parts of the developing world because, you know, at home, children don't have broadband or, you know, high-tech laptops or iPads or, you know, even a smartphone. They don't even have electricity. Um, and um, so when the world was turning to ed tech and, um, you know, tech-enabled solutions, we were thinking, well... What, what will these children, how will they learn? How can they possibly learn? Mm. So the government of Uganda started a program of radio, um, you know, ra radio learning. Um, okay. But even with that, you know, not every household had a radio. Um, so we, it, it really forced us to think about how, how to do things differently and, and how to really push ourselves and think out of our comfort zone about, about how to come up with a solution. And so... Our teachers mobilized and started going into the communities, face-to-face, -face, outside in kind of household groups, and just started delivering lessons like that, just every day moving from household to household, um, delivering lessons to make sure that, you know, it's nearly a year and schools in Uganda are still not open. Um, you know, in, in, in the global north, many of our schools opened in September, um, and primary seven have only just opened in October in, in Uganda, but the rest, primary one, is still, still not open. So we're expecting them to open in January 2021. And we just can't wait to welcome our, school, our, our students back. Yeah. Um, but up until then, we've also, you know, many of our supporters in this context of COVID where a lot of donors have pulled back and have become more insular and you know, looking within their countries and borders, um, you know, we've been really lucky that our supporters have, have, have stepped up. And so we've been able to do things like, you know, provide um, food, food packages um, to, to all our students. We've provided home learning kits, you know, with pens, pencils, mm -hmm. um, exercise books, um, also printouts of, of the curriculum and, and, and the work that they need to study. So we, We've really tried to um, to do things differently and, and reach out to, to to the children that we serve because what we know is that you know when schools are closed and children aren't in school, schools are protection mechanisms for children. Um, so when children are not in school, then it's 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 happened. It's ha we're gonna we're gonna hear about it if we haven't already. That you know we'll see increases in child labour, in child marriage. Um, in domestic violence, in, in, in all kinds of things. And, you know, we've tried to do our very best to make sure that in, in whatever small way we can, that those children are still able to learn, even if it's just for a few hours a day. And we really, really hope that um, in January, when schools reopen, that they all come back. And we're really gonna make a concerted effort to find those children and make sure they do come back. But we're lucky that we've, we've not lost touch. Great. So, yeah. I think you make a really important point where, you know, in the UK and Canada and the global north, as you said, you know, we sort of quite swiftly adapted from classroom learning. Everyone jumped onto Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whichever sort of, you know, platform they've got. Um, and we complain here in the UK about, you know, internet penetration in 
the furthest parts of Scotland and rural broadband, all that sort of stuff. But actually, in somewhere like Uganda and in hundreds of you know cities and towns across the world, there is no internet penetration at all. And you know, if one person has a smartphone in a village, then that's that's an amazing thing, and they're connected. But um, you know, I think there people forget that. Um, a whole generation of children are suffering because of because of a global lockdown and it's um, I think you know you guys being able to go and teach house to house and, and also you know providing that sort of holistic support with the food packages and all of these sorts of things the support mechanisms will make a real difference and will you know hopefully ensure that these children haven't lost out too much um, and will and will continue to thrive. I really hope so we're looking forward to having them back in school. I can yeah. Imagine. So my final question for you is, what next for Farah Williamson? Oh God. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> well, so I've been on maternity leave for a week, so I'm looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a real blessing. So I'm looking forward to getting back to work and being back at plan with, with all of my colleagues and seeing what they've been doing in terms of um, yeah, working on, on, on kind of post-COVID and and how that's impacted the world and, and really doing, doing my bit and, and playing my part in, uh, in designing and, and being part of the projects that, that, that they're delivering. So yeah, really looking forward to that. Um, and continue our work with Wakadogo, of course. Uh, we're, not, we're, you know, we're not about to give up and go home anytime soon. So I still feel a lot of passion and energy towards that. And um, you know, I, would, I would just say to anyone who's wanting to, to do something like that, do it. Don't, you know, don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't. Um, and if they do, just do it. Uh, because we, you know, I remember, I remember that. I remember people saying, well, what do you know about development? Yeah. Or what do you know about fundraising? And at the time, I knew nothing. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's up to us as individuals to, to go out there and, and do whatever we can in, in whatever small or, or big way to, to help make a difference. You know, whether it's volunteer at a soup kitchen or help a neighbor or go and start a project in northern Uganda, whatever it is, um, I think it can, uh, it, can, it, can change, it can change both the person who you are doing something for and, and your own life. Yeah. Um, it's not a selfless thing. It's actually a, a really wonderful thing. So... Yeah, I'm so honoured to have had the opportunity to tell you a bit more about um, my story today. And so thank you, Zaki. No, it's been, an, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, we will continue to chat and discuss this for many hours after the, ca the cameras have stopped rolling. But just for our audience, I just want to say thank you so much for giving up your time. I know you've got little one who's wanting her mummy back. Mm -hmm. And just to tell us about plan, about your experience, and most importantly about Wakadogo and all the wonderful work you've been doing over the last 10, 15 years on that. It's been really, really enlightening and, and really positive to hear about it. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and thank you to our audience for joining us as well. Thank you. Thanks, Zaki. Have a great day. Thanks, and you too. There are those who enter the world in such poverty that they are deprived of both the means and the motivation to improve their lot. Unless these unfortunates can be touched with the spark which ignites the spirit of individual enterprise and determination, they will only sink back into renewed apathy, degradation and despair. It is for us, who are more fortunate, to provide that spark.